pleasure to welcome you to the keynote address for the 8th Annual Context Multidisciplinary Conference. Um, I'd like to begin by making a few recognitions. Um, I'd like to um, introduce the or acknowledge uh, the uh, Acting Associate Dean of the College, Ian Marshall, and Assistant Dean Michael Gordon. Um, thank you. We also have in the audience Bernadette Tiernan, the Director for um, Continuing Professional Development, Rajnell Griffin, and Tim Stansfield from the Academic Success Center as well, to give them a round of applause. And I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank the absolutely phenomenal committee who put this together. Um, the chairs of the committee, Dr. Jonah Hill and Dr. Emma Haney. Um, uh, the other members, Justina, uh, Dr. Deshina, Justina Ikosha, Dr. Mark Ellis, Dr. Joshua Hall, and Dr. Navi Gill. Absolutely incredible, um, into, you know, in, engaged, intellectual, put, brought this together, and the logistics and everything. And I just want to do an absolute round of applause for the, for the committee that just worked. They were supported in that work by members of our staff. Um, uh, Tia Cherry, who is our director for uh, academic initiatives and student engagement. Yolanda Martinez, who handles all, Martinez, who handles, handles all of the sort of logistics stuff. Carolyn Biondo, who was that uh, cheerful face that met you at the top of the stairs. And uh, Cassie Rendon, who is our graduate assistant, who's taking all of our pictures. So a round of applause for them as well. <laughs> this is no small venture. It takes an, an awful lot of work, a lot of uh, research, a lot of preparation. Um, and it takes resources as well. And so I'd like to also thank um, the offices, the Office of Sophomore Junior Experience, as well as all of the departments of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences for their support of this conference. The Context Conference Series is part of a commitment of, Willi of William Patterson University and the College of Humanities and Social Sciences to live our mission. Specifically, we are committed to engaging community by examining critical subject matter with a multitude of lenses. This type of critical engagement is essential to maintaining a vibrant democracy. This year's conference title, My, Sand My Ancestors' Crimes, Not Mine, Grappling with the Legacy of Privilege and Power While Building a Better Tomorrow, grapples with the past, engages in dialogues, and charts a course for a hopeful future. Today's keynote address will be presented by Dr. Kalila Brown-Dean, Associate Professor of Political Science, She's a nationally known and respected expert on the American criminal justice system, group identity, and political development. Dr. Brown Dean is a native of Lynchburg, Virginia, so she's a southerner like me, yeah. She received her BA in government from the University of Virginia and her PhD from, in political science from the Ohio State, yeah, I got it right, the Ohio State University. Dr. Brown Dean is an award-winning political analyst, advisor, and commentator for numerous agencies and organizations, including the New York Times, the Congressional Black Caucus, NPR, CNN, the Wall Street Journal. So I'm, I'm out of breath trying to see all the, uh, she's the Fox News Radio, NPR, Doc, Democracy Now!, Al Jazeera, The Hill, The Washington Post. And she's a frequent guest on NPR's Where We Live. And she's lectured at, lectures at, has lectured at some of the world's leading universities, including William Patterson University. Her research interest centers on voting rights, race, election, administration, and public policy. She's published numerous academic and popular pieces, and included, including an, a co-authored report on the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that was presented at the 50th anniversary of the celebration of the historic Bloody Sunday March in Selma, Alabama. She's featured in documentaries like The Color of Justice and Extinction, and was recognized by Diverse Magazine as one of the top 25 women in higher education. Dr. Brown Dean is chair of the directors for Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, one of the oldest and largest communi community foundations in the nation, and has held appointed and elected positions in various professional organizations, including the American Political Science Association and the National Association for Ethnic Studies. She's the author of a newly published Identity Politics in the United States. 
This book explores how conflict over group identity are inescapable features of American political development. Dr. Brown Dean shows us how we got here, and more importantly, how do we move forward? And you can see why it's a perfect fit for a keynote address for this conference. It is my pleasure to speak not to have her speak not only because she's an exceptional scholar, but because I've had the pleasure of watching her star rise since we first met as graduate students so long ago at the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kalila Brown Dean. Good morning. Now, I'm from the South, as you heard, so when people don't speak back to me, I get offended. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Let me begin by thanking Dean Davis and the College of Humanities and Social Sciences for inviting me here today. I realize that talking about power and privilege is never easy. And so I was particularly struck by the theme for this year's conference. I know that for you as members of this community, these aren't just abstract questions, right? I know that you grapple with these challenges every day here at William Patterson and in the community. I know that they have an impact on how you learn. They have an impact on what you learn and from whom. And these challenges shape your level of comfort and safety. They shape the extent to which you feel like you are citizens of this university and of this nation. So I want to begin my remarks by simply saying, I see you and I thank you for being here today. Now you can tell from my bio that I am a nerd, like a hardcore nerd but I get paid to read, to write, and to tell people what I think. All the things that got me teased and bullied as a kid, I now get to make money doing. So I promise you it indeed gets better. Being a nerd allows me to interview people like the great Danny Glover. It has given me the opportunity to interview Tarana Burke, who was the founder of the Me Too movement over 10 years ago. It has allowed me to make great friends with people like Reginald Dwayne Betts, who at the age of 16 was sentenced to nine years in prison for stealing a car. Sentenced at 16 to serve nine years in an adult prison. Dwayne graduated from Yale Law School two years ago and is now an attorney. So through my nerddom, I get to interact with people every day who highlight America's promise. And so my work as a scholar is driven by one key question, and that is how do we make American democracy stronger and better for every American? At the core of that is an interest in the myriad ways that identity shapes and is shaped by the political process. So in my new book, which comes out this Monday, I address the use of the term identity. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I address the use of the term identity politics. Because currently, when we hear that term, we think about it in a negative, pejorative way. Identity politics is used for people who cling to their group identity or who feel some sense of group membership. And too often, people use that phrase to think about victimhood. And so I reject that notion. In the book, I argue that identity is at the core of every aspect of American politics. So we chose this cover because it reminds me of the place where I have felt the safest, the most loved, and the most welcomed in my life, and that place was my great-grandmother's porch. So growing up in rural Virginia, I was keenly aware of the many ways that identity plays through. I knew that it meant something in that town to be an African-American family who owned their home on Main Street in the town. But to understand that we as an African-American family lived directly across the street from a white family who had our same last name. And Pendleton is a pretty distinct last name, so I couldn't understand 
How is it that these two families live just a street apart and share the same last name, and yet we look so different, we live so differently? That was about identity and about the complex ways in which our history brings us to this current moment. Now, I also know that in our country, for many people, diversity is used as this catch-all phrase. Diversity is viewed as something for other people. Diversity is what other people and what other groups do. But identity is much more intentional. Identity recognizes that each of us, whether born here or brought here, whether our gender identity matches that identity on our certificate or not, whether we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day or Columbus Day, each of us has an identity that shapes and is shaped by our experience. And so democracy in the United States is built on that battle of ideas related to how we see ourselves, how we see others, and the tools that we have to reinforce those distinctions. So if you remember nothing else from me today, I want you to remember this. And that is that identity politics is not about creating a hierarchy of oppression. Identity politics is not about who has suffered the most or who is entitled to the greatest reward. And I want you to also know that identity politics is as American as apple pie. So when we think of identity politics in the United States, we have to think about the meaning of democracy in this country. So democracy happens when athletes take a knee to protest violence. Democracy happens when brave men and women fight for freedoms that too many of us take for granted. Democracy happens in churches in Louisiana and synagogues in Pittsburgh and Poway, California. Democracy happens on campuses of UNC Charlotte, of Sandy Hook and Virginia Tech. When in the midst of overwhelming fear and hatred, communities come together and act from a place of love and determination, that is democracy. And so even now, when our country feels so heavy, when it does not seem like there's a space for us to acknowledge our differences and to engage those differences without losing sight of civility, Democracy demands a collective investment in moving forward. Now, I know that democracy in the United States has always been aspirational. That even as Thomas Jefferson penned those eloquent words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Jefferson wrote those words while enslaving hundreds of Africans on his plantation in the Commonwealth of Virginia, including a woman named Sally Hemings who birthed a number of children by Thomas Jefferson, even though she was the half-sister of Thomas Jefferson's wife. That is the reality of the potential, the promise, and actually the performance of American democracy. And so it's not lost on me this morning that I stand before you as an African-American woman with an Arabic name a first-generation college graduate raised in the heart of the Bible Belt, raised by a single mother who dared believe in the possibility of education. I know that the founders of this great nation never could have imagined that I would be here before you today. And yet, here I am. And more importantly, here we are together. And so as we collectively honor 2019 as the 400th anniversary of enslaved Africans arriving on the shores of Jamestown, we do so keenly aware that each of us has a unique American story. That story makes us different, but not deficient. It makes us not better than, but equal to. And yet, even as we affirm our distinctiveness and celebrate our differences, we have to acknowledge that for many people, diversity is viewed as a threat. That to many people, when you mention the word diversity or democracy, they see it as a way to erase the status quo. But I want you to understand is that when people say that acknowledging 
Our painful past makes them uncomfortable and that we should stop talking about the past. I want you to remember that you cannot fix that which you do not face. So we have to acknowledge that often when people say, get over the past, what they really mean is get over yours and let me hold on to mine. How else could we explain those who dismiss talking about the legacies of slavery while defending flying the Confederate flag or maintaining the names of offensive mascots as a symbol of their reverence for the past? Today's public square is clouded and polluted by diversions and deceptions, so that for many people, their allegiance to party and position weakens their commitment to our shared humanity. So that this week, as members of the United States Senate have proposed the Justice for Victims of Lynching Act, we hear from politicians who use that word lynching to address a political process. When we hear political leaders and cultural figures use that phrase out of context, we all should take a step back and ask why, regardless of party or ideology. To be clear, President Trump is not being lynched. To be clear, R. Kelly and Bill Cosby were not lynched. They are going through or have gone through a legal process that does not match the extra legal practice of lynching that was meant to humiliate an entire community of people. The language that we use conveys our values. So I want you to think about how using the word lynching resonates with the descendants of 11 Italian Americans who were lynched in New Orleans after falsely being accused of killing a police chief? What is the impact on the descendants of Leo Frank, who as a Jewish man living in the South was lynched by an angry mob who feared that his Jewish blood would contaminate the community? What is the impact of using the word lynching on countless Latino immigrants who were lynched across the West? Or on the descendants of James Byrd Jr., whose murder in 1998 prompted new hate crime statutes. The past is always prologue. And so it is no wonder then that in 2019, the state of Mississippi has had to erect a fourth marker to honor Emmett Till. What does it mean that in 2019, we need a bulletproof marker to honor a 14-year-old child who was murdered simply because someone saw his body and his presence as a threat. What does it mean when college students proudly post on their Snapchat and their Instagram pictures of them shooting at this marker to a 14-year-old child? The reality is that to be a member of an underrepresented group in this country is to be at once invisible and hyper-visible. And it is why addressing the lessons from the past and the prospects for the future affirm an African proverb that make it clear. If we want to go fast, we can go alone. But if we want to go far, we must go together. So I am going to do something that I never do in my classes. My students will be totally shocked by what I'm about to ask you to do. And what I'm going to ask you to do is this. Please pull out your cell phones. This never happens in my class. Right? Go ahead, pull out your cell phones. So it does not look like this is connected through. So we're going to keep going because I don't want to miss time on this. So I'm going to ask you this, right? This is crowd participation. Again, I'm from the South. We do call and response. So I want you to think about when you hear the phrase American democracy, someone shout out to me, what is the word that comes to mind when you hear the phrase American democracy? Corrupt. Corrupt. Anyone else? Corporate oligarchy. Corporate oligarchy. Oh, good job. OK, more. <laughs> What comes to mind when you hear the phrase American democracy? Mocking. Mocking. What else? Puppet. Puppet. What else? Lies. Lies. What else? 
Inequality, keep going. Hypocritical. Wow. Okay, keep going. I'm okay. I'm right. What else? Something else. Disruption. What do you notice? By all of those words that you and your peers shouted out to me, what do you notice from them? It's all negative, right? Not a single person here had something positive to say in response to the phrase American democracy. And so my question back to all of you then is what are we going to do about that? Not what are you going to do, not what am I going to do, but what are we going to do collectively? So here's the spoiler alert, right? The future of American democracy is not dependent on President Donald J. Trump. The future of democracy is not dependent on the 525,600 people, we may be up or down today, I don't know, who are running for the Democratic nomination. None of those people will determine the future of American democracy. Its future will depend on all of us. It will depend on our willingness to invest in this project and to be willing to claim now in the present that which we seek to see for our collective future, right? And so in spite of all of those talking heads who get it wrong, it's on us. To the great James Baldwin once said, I love America more than any other country in this world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. To be critical of this country that we love and that we revere does not make us unpatriotic. It makes us invested and committed. So whether you express your commitment by wearing a MAGA hat, Kanye West, or by joining in a protest rally, each of us has the right to work for a country that reflects our values. Now for me, nothing affirms that right more than my calling to be a mother. I'm a mother to a bright, inquisitive, demanding 11-year-old who reminds me that as adults, we have to get it right so that she can inherit a more just world. And so a few years ago, I was asked to co-author this report on the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and as you heard in my bio, we went to Selma, Alabama to present that report. And so my family and I thought we were really, really fortunate because we were given these golden tickets. I'm a Willy Wonka fan, the original, not the remake. Right? We were given these golden tickets to be able to go to the VIP area and to be able to meet people. And I thought, this is great. And then I realized that going to that section meant we had to arrive four hours early. It's Selma, Alabama in March. It's super hot, it's super humid. The air is stagnant. And my colleague and I had to take our children for four hours in the sun. It wasn't a good look, right? But while we are waiting there, President George W. Bush goes to the podium. And shortly after, President Barack Obama goes to the podium. And while we are sitting there waiting with the kids, this man who is standing beside us begins to weep uncontrollably. And he raises his arm toward the stage where Barack Obama and George W. Bush are. This is a man who was born and raised in Selma, Alabama, who as a young person participated on that march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Edmund Pettus, former Grand Wizard of the Klan in the South. And that young man marched on that bridge because he believed in the potential of American democracy. So as he's stretching his hand, the kids start to notice that he has scarring on his arm. Now the kids do what every parent, it is our worst nightmare. What do you think the kids did? Sir, what's wrong with your arm? I was done. Like, no, you don't do that, you're embarrassing, right? But he was much more gracious than we were. And he told the kids what happened to his arm is that when he was on that bridge in Selma in 1965, he was attacked by dogs and had water hoses turned on him, his skin peeling away from his arm. 
He carries those scars with him 50 years later, and yet he still came back to Selma because he wanted to pay homage to the people who had gone before him and to see what was possible. So the next day, we participate in the official commemoration march. And it was amazing to me to be there and see it through the eyes of children. This is my daughter there. She's 11 now and is much taller. She's my height now. And that's my husband to the left of her. So we're walking on this bridge. There are thousands of people. Again, it's super Alabama hot. And this kid stops in the middle and will not move. And I'm asking her, what's wrong? We have to go, there are a lot of people, let's go. Mommy doesn't do crowds, what are we doing? And she stopped because she was afraid of what was waiting for us on the other side. And it stopped us in our tracks because we realized that what this kid was telling us is often how we as people in this country approach democracy out of fear and being paralyzed by that uncertainty. On that bridge, she got to meet Reverend William Barber, the architect of the Moral Monday movement. She took selfies with the first two women to ever legally marry in the state of Alabama. We listened to a group of formerly incarcerated people who were marching across the bridge singing civil rights hymns. And we watched as people who were undocumented held signs because they were inspired by the freedom fighters of the 1960s. We realized that on that bridge that is soaked in the blood of martyrs and covered in the tears of children, on that bridge, we got to see all that was possible in this country if we commit to it. So we've been on a lot of family trips. We've been to Disney a lot of times. And my kid still says that is her favorite family trip of all time. So I don't know what she's going to think of me when she becomes a teenager, but for right now, today, she thinks her mom is cool, and so I'm gonna hold on to that as long as I can, right? So this next image will be difficult to see, but I want you to be uncomfortable because democracy is messy and it's uncomfortable. So while we are there and we're exiting out, my daughter says, mommy, that's John Lewis. And John Lewis came over to say hello. And I thought about what did it mean for John Lewis as a young people to lead that march in Selma, to suffer permanent brain, brain damage and physical injury on that bridge simply for demanding the ability to vote to go from being on the ground beaten by state troopers to now being a member of the United States Congress. What is it that helped him go from being on the ground in Selma to the halls of America's greatest legislative institution? What is that hope and that courage? And so when we returned home about two weeks after that trip to Selma of our daughter understanding John Lewis being beaten down in 1965 and believing that that was the past, that we had left the past in the past, I got a text message saying, you have to get to Virginia right now. And people were asking me to go back home to Virginia because of this young man who was on the ground, bloodied and beaten in Charlottesville, Virginia. His name is Martise Johnson. And I want you to remember that name and hold that name because we often know the names of people who have died in police custody but we forget the names of people who survive. His name is Martise Johnson. Martise was a student at my alma mater, the University of Virginia. And Martise was from the south side of Chicago, raised by a single mother who was raising three boys, who believed that if she could just get her son out of Chicago, just get her son out of the south side, that he would be okay. So she did what many parents do. She worked really hard to send her son off to college. And so there was Martise at one of the finest universities in this country. I'm a bit biased, just saying, right? <laughs> finest institution in this country on the dean's list, working hard, speaking multiple languages, and this is what happened to him. So for those of you who don't know his story, 
Martise was hanging out with friends, fellow students at UVA, when an alcoholic beverage control officer, so we have a deputized police force in Virginia who handle liquor offenses. The officer accused him of using a fake ID and tried to arrest him. Now the bar owner comes out and says, no officer, you have the wrong person. He never tried to get in, he never tried to use a fake ID, and the officer slams Martise to the ground multiple times. This is the bloody image that was sent to me that night. The next day, as I'm trying to figure out how do I teach my class, get my kids to school, and get on a plane to Charlottesville, I get a video of that night. And in that video, you can hear Marty screaming and crying, but I go to UVA, but I go to UVA. And that wasn't about entitlement, it was about a plea for humanity. And so we went back to the University of Virginia we brought back with us 500 alumni from across the country, people who love their alma mater, but more importantly, people who write checks and can get attention to the things that they are demanding. And so this is from the march that we led to the university president's home that is Martise in the middle. You recognize that person there. Uh, and that is my classmate, Pat Collier, who now works in government in the state of Illinois. So as we are marching up the hill to the president's house to deliver these demands, a police car comes barreling down the driveway. And I instantly feel Martise's body tense up. And I lean over to him and say, don't worry, we got you, you're going to be okay. What happened to Martise wasn't because he wasn't speaking the king's English properly. Martise wasn't reduced to this bloody mess, handcuffed and shackled to the back of an ambulance before his wounds, and you all know a head wound is serious, before his wounds could be addressed. Martise was there because someone looked at him and didn't think that he belonged. And so we teach our children to respect law enforcement and we should do that. We have to push back against the narrative that all cops are bad and can't be trusted. But we have to also strongly admonish those who see black and see brown and think criminal. So fast forward two years, and I have to go back to my beloved alma mater once again, because people carrying tiki torches marched across campus chanting, we will not be replaced blood and soil because people decided to go to the campus of the University of Virginia bringing with them racist and anti-Semitic chants. Heather Heyer lost her life, hundreds others endangered, simply because they decided to stand up for the very truths that our forefathers said were self-evident. And so now where we are today, that history, those lessons from the past, means that for too many of us, if has become our favorite word, right? If Tamir Rice hadn't been playing in the park, he wouldn't have been shot and killed, even as we know that the officer who shot and killed this child was just rehired in a new police department this week. If Botham Jean had gotten on the ground in his own apartment, Maybe we wouldn't be having this debate about whether it was proper for his brother to hug the person who took his life, never realizing that for families like Botham Jean's who have lost everything, the very least we owe them as a nation is their ability to grieve on their own terms. If a Tatiana Jefferson had just put her hands up faster, but I want you to know that if is the enemy of change and it is the opposite of progress. Think about the fact that earlier this week, Princeton Seminary announced that it would set aside $27 million in reparations for its ties to and profits from slavery. $27 million sounds like a lot of money. And when I was paying back my student loans, $2,000 sounded like a lot of money, right? But when you think about that this venerable institution in the North benefited from slavery in the South by investing in banks that profited from slavery, when you think about the fact that the founding leaders of the Princeton Seminary used slave labor, 
and that many more advocated for sending black people back to Liberia. You understand that this seminary and its wealth is built on the degradation of others, that it profited from a practice of setting a value on human lives. And so in doing that, Princeton Seminary helps us understand that it's not just about individuals when we talk about the legacies of the past, it's about institutions and the systematic way that we determine who has access to education, employment, and health long after the individuals have passed on. Those institutions and those norms remain. So few institutions to me in the United States better highlight the legacies of slavery and the ways in which those historical misdeeds remain with us than our criminal justice system in the United States. And so the bulk of my research is on punishment, not crime, but punishment, and the policy choices that we make. Let me give you an example. There's a very famous prison in Louisiana. It's called the Angola Penitentiary. It is one of the most famous prisons in the world. Angola says to its inmates, 90% of those inmates are there for a life sentence including people who have been charged with possession of drugs, not intent to distribute, not trafficking, but possession of drugs, who are now serving a life sentence. Think about what that would mean on a college campus if we treated people who were in possession as though they were felonious criminals who needed to have a life sentence. I do my work quite a bit in Louisiana and the Angola Penitentiary. And so one of the things that I noticed there is that Louisiana was one of the first states to lock up women. And Louisiana not just locked up women, but it also made the children of those women serve time with their mothers. Right? So when you look at the census data, you notice that in, say, 1870, there are five children behind bars. But then when you look at 1871, there are 22 children, even though there were no new admits. So I ask, how is that possible that a woman who is incarcerated would then have more children while in prison? How does that happen, friends? So those women were being raped by guards in Louisiana prisons. And then their children, when they were old enough, were being taken away from them and being sold off into slavery. The profits of selling those children who were born of rape in Louisiana prisons then went to fund the public school system in the state of Louisiana, a public school system which at that time only educated white children. So black babies were used to fund education systems for white children. That's the legacy that we have to acknowledge. And now today, the legacies of slavery, the ways that it still shows up, happens every time there is a natural disaster, like the campfires last year in California. Who are the people that are sent to the front lines to fight those fires? They are California prison inmates who are paid $1 per day to fight the deadliest, most devastating fire in modern history for this country. If you attend a state university in Mississippi, in Alabama, or Louisiana, when you go to class, you notice that there are people making sure your lawns are perfectly manicured who are wearing orange jumpsuits. Because to this day, we still use prison inmate labor in order to create wealth and generate profit for other people. If you're in Louisiana and you're having a lovely dinner party this weekend, you need some help serving your lovely guests, you go to the local sheriff and you rent out prison inmates to serve your guests. That is the legacy of slavery and of the past that is with us today. And so when we are reconciling our past failings with our future strivings, I want you to think about the relationship between democracy and justice in this country. Justice is about acknowledging that 65 years ago, Thurgood Marshall stood before the US Supreme Court. And now here we are in 2019 where our schools, our public schools are more segregated than ever before, where 80% of students in America's public schools come from homes where poverty is a real and persistent factor. And yet here in this great state of New Jersey, 
There are school districts who want to punish children because their parents don't have enough money to cover their lunch debts. That in this great state of New Jersey, there are districts who want to tell children you cannot go to prom if your parents have not settled your, student, your school lunch debt. And so when we think about justice and democracy and the capacity of education, we have to understand that for many young people, education can be a safe place when they are catching hell at home. And how do we reconcile that need that education be a civil right with the idea that every child deserves access? Justice and democracy at this moment in our country is about recognizing that African-American women and Latinas are the fastest growing prison populations in this country. 60% of women who are behind bars are the custodial parent for a minor child. So as we are sending more mothers into prison, we are leaving more children behind who are often sent into foster care. All of the data lets us know that children of color, queer children, and older children are less likely to be adopted out of that system. So justice is about realizing it's not just about the person who has broken the law, but it is about their families and the communities to which they belong. And as we approach the 2020 census, understanding justice and democracy acknowledges that how we count prison inmates, that where we count prison inmates, will have an impact on the resources that flows to various communities that using black and brown bodies within prisons to inflate census counts moves us further away from true representation. Justice is about understanding that even though reentry and second chance are the key buzzwords that we hear today, for many people they simply want a viable first chance. Justice is also about understanding that children in this country should have access to clean, safe water. That in this country, the fact that there are young people in Newark public schools who don't have access to clean water means that we have not made their health and their well-being a priority. And so as I close my remarks, I want to remind you that as a nation, we stand on the cusp of one of the most significant years of our time. 2020 will determine how well we are able to collectively reconcile our past with our future. So in addition to the census, 2020 will also be the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, an act that struck down poll taxes and literacy tests, tactics that were used to disenfranchise blacks in the South, but were first used in the North to keep white ethnic immigrants from voting. And now in 2019, 55 years after that act, there are still people who are barred from voting because someone's political choice is different. In 2020, we'll recognize the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment that granted black men the ability to vote. And now in this country, when we look in states like Florida, where one in four black men is prohibited from voting because of a felony conviction, it is time to ask ourselves whether we are committed to that future. In 2020, we will recognize the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment that allowed women to vote in national elections. And while some fight so that women can have a seat at the table, I would dare say that 100 years later, it is time for women to have seats at the table. And if people don't allow that to happen, it's time to flip that table. And so together as we await key Supreme Court rulings that will spell out workplace protections for members of the LGBTQ plus community, as we think about our commitment to building bridges rather than walls, and as we have important elections at the local, state, and national level, I want to leave you with the words of the late Congressman Elijah Cummings, who once said, I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's all I want. That's all I want. And so my friends, may we all commit to working for oceans of justice and rivers of fairness. 
Thank you. Thanks, Susan. I'm gonna, we're going to take a few questions, and while you are formulating your, your thoughts, I'm going to uh, make a few more recognitions. Uh, we have the pleasure of having, having um, University President Richard Harold Dobler, who, who is here. We also have uh, Vice President of Marketing, Public Relations and Marketing, um, Stuart Goldstein, and uh, Vice President of Student Development, Mickey Camarado, who uh, is here as well. So, questions? Hey, how's it going? I really liked your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm Scott Wordsman. Uh, I'm a professor of writing here. Um, it's, it's funny because uh, identity politics is kind of slandered. We see it all the time online and stuff. But do you think there's ever like excesses of identity politics in the way that, um, like a good example I can think of is that uh, for the nomination for president in 2020, um, on the left we have Bernie Sanders, who is a white man and then we have Elizabeth Warren, who's a white woman, which would be great, obviously, to have a white female president, but um, her track record, it kind of, um, she's a lot less in line with like redistributive pol policies than Bernie is, but people uphold her because they're like, oh, we want you know, a white female. But if you look into her, um, her voting record, she's voted on all of the, the military budgets, um, and she was a Republican until 1996, so it's like, when you bring up some of these inconvenient things, it, it kind of makes you question, um, you know, is identity politics good or is it bad? I'm curious to see, you know, do those excesses play a role in, you know, convincing people which person is better for a democracy? Thank you for your question. I think what we have to do when we think about identity politics, so we have to understand how complex our own identities are. And part of that means that we have to reject this monolithic view that to be a woman means that you believe this. That to be an African American, what you believe is this. That to be a Southerner, what you support is this. True identity politics and representation in the United States is about understanding that people bring different views and experiences within these sorts of groupings of identity. Um, you know, the example that always comes to mind is after the 2016 presidential election. And so many of uh, people came to me very well-meaning saying, you know, oh, we want to wear a safety pin to show that we are in solidarity with you. And my response was solidarity with whom? Like, who is the me that you think you are in solidarity with and what does that mean? Because when we break down the data, right, it wasn't the fact that all women were voting for Hillary Clinton because they had the opportunity to elect the first women, when really the majority of white women, college educated or not, were casting their ballot for Donald Trump. Or if we look at 2017 and the Alabama Senate election with Doug Jones and Roy Moore, right, those kinds of siloed views of this group votes there. So what I think identity politics is about, for me, at least in the book, is about a recognition of how those groups affect our experiences, but it is also about telling people you need to focus on policy and priority. Because just because you look like me and however manifestation we give that does not mean that you are best for me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dina Janos. I'm a junior here at Willie P. Um, my question is, obviously, I'm in college and I'm getting educated. Oh, it died. Oh, no, it didn't. I don't know. We hear you. Hey. So, um, obviously, I'm in college. I'm getting educated. But how do I go back home to where I recognize that the people of my town do not have the same opportunities as I did? And maybe they're ignorant in a way where they just don't know. 
how do I go back and give them the same education that I'm getting? So one of the things that, um, this is my 16th year, oh my gosh, I'm dating my stuff. This is my 16th year as a university professor. And people often talk about this imposter syndrome of what does it mean to be a person in the academy? And I push back and say, what does it mean for me to go back home to my little small town and realizing that there are hundreds of people there who are much smarter than I could ever be, but that I had opportunities that they did not. And part of going back, however you configure community, part of going back is going back from a space of humility. That it is not your calling to go back and educate people or to assume that they don't know their best interests. The going back has to come in listening, right? Every person in this country knows what's important to them. They know what they need to get through the day. And yet if you listen to the chaos of like presidential debates and people use all these terms, at the end of the day, what I wanna know is that I can work hard and have money left over so that if it's a $200 emergency, I don't freak out wondering how I'm gonna cover it. People know that they want to be safe. They want to know that at the end of the month, they're not going to end up with more days in the month than they have dollars in the bank. So part of what you can do as a young people is having those conversations. And you as a person at this university, because of all the amazing opportunities that you have here, have an opportunity to bring those voices back to this space. So it has to be reciprocal, not just what we take back to community, but what we lift up and listen to from community and how whatever career path you all are going to go into, because I know you are all going to be wildly successful and you will donate back to your college to support programs like this, right? We do it with people who have a basic sense and commitment to humanity, just as the fact that you are here today and ask that question means that you are. And so I'm excited to see what you're going to do with it. Thank you. Hold, hold on. Go. Hi, my name is Marisol Jimenez, and um, you mentioned in your presentation that you were a first-generation college student. Um, I'm also as well. Um, so my question is: is that um, I'm guessing. I always encourage my parents to get an education to understand more about the world, especially how it changes throughout the years. Um, would you also encourage your parents as well to receive an education, whether it's getting their GED or um, pursuing, a col um, pursuing college courses as well as I am? Would you do the same? And do you recommend that other students like myself, first generations, encourage parents to also attend college? I think that we should always be challenging and encouraging ourselves and the people we care about to dream bigger, to pursue more than they could have expected. That doesn't require a formal educational experience, right? My father is now deceased, but my mother raised three girls and made sure that she worked hard every day so that we could have opportunities and did not have to go through some of those same challenges. She went on to get an associate's degree. She's now director of marketing and communications for our local government. She now writes the speeches for the high profile politicians in Virginia that I go, wait a minute, you didn't write that? My mom wrote that, right? Like you and all your fancy degrees and all your college debt, look what she did with this associate's degree. I'm a big champion for community colleges. I'm a big champion for people understanding that education should be a lifelong process. That even after you graduate from this university, that learning has to continue. Particularly when we think about our current public square and political space, it becomes obvious sometimes when people are not willing to, to move beyond what they've always known. And congratulations. Hi, my name's Elijah Farrar. Um, I'm a senior here. And um, I had a question. Do you think our society's growing cancel culture is kind of a way of deferring responsibility onto celebrities who say something wrong? Or 
perhaps it's like us not using our, or it's kind of like the easiest example mm -hmm. for us to kind of go at. It's an excellent example and an excellent question. Um, I abhor cancel culture because it is easy to say, look, we've canceled Kanye without understanding that what he is lifting up in terms of his views and dare I say his ignorance, right? He's not the only person who believes that. So if we keep saying, if you say something or you do something with which we don't agree, you're just canceled, then we never actually engage that difference. It does not mean that you have to accept and tolerate ignorance, but it also means that in our lives, each of us has wanted grace at some point. We've all done something or said something that we look back on and we think, oh, I can't believe I did that, right? And if you don't believe me, look at your social media from two years ago. Like I know Facebook is for old people, but look at your social media from two years ago. The things that you thought were cool to say are really different. And the other thing that I feel about cancel culture, we have to take some ownership. We have to take a lot more ownership. I don't look to Kanye West for um, political advice any more than I look to Drake for uh, liquor options, right? I believe people have to stay in their lane. And that's part of the conversation of what we can do. A couple years ago, a student came into class and had on a t-shirt that said, I am not my grandparents, you can catch these hands. And I totally threw out my, you haven't seen this shirt? Google it. It's, it's disgusting. Totally threw out my lecture plan to that day. Because I wanted to have this conversation. What does that mean to say, I am not my grandparents, right? I am not my ancestors. The most brilliant people who practice resistance on an everyday basis were grandparents who did not have the formal opportunities that you all do, but who practice resistance in small ways and in big ways. And so cancel culture isn't just about the people amongst us today who say or do ignorant, abhorrent things. It is also about how we look back and the ways in which we judge our ancestors or older people based on our present lens. The very fact that we can say that, right? That someone can be in a school parking lot and yell at a parent and have slurs as a part of that, and that video goes viral, and they lose their job, and people think, look, we won. What do you do when that person goes and works in another school district and brings with them those same views? So that's where we have to be willing to engage difference, even when it's difficult, because that's when we see a difference in outcome. Thank you for your question. My name is Andrew Elsie, I'm a first year student, and I totally agree with you that we need to start talking more and stop with the whole cancel culture, because if we keep throwing out things we don't like, then we'll have nothing, because mm. we all don't always agree. But my one question is, if nothing else, what would you say the biggest takeaway should be from everything you've said today? Wow, um, let's see, let's boil that down, right? The biggest takeaway that I would say is that we have to own democracy in this country. I think we are willing to cede our power to others who only have their best interests in mind. And if we allow people to do that, we can't blame them for doing that. That starts with small things. That starts with telling your story and telling our collective stories. That's when we start to see those commonalities, but it also means I can be proud of who I am and it does not take away from you. If all we do is throw up our hands and say, oh, all this chaos in Washington or all this chaos in Trenton, then where is our agency? And the last thing I would say, particularly for the young people in the room, you all have access to power in a way that my generation never could have imagined. You have it literally at your fingertips with cell phones and with technology. But the question is, what are you doing with that power? All right? Think about the March on Washington. In the 1960s, there was no WhatsApp to tell people, hey, we're gonna meet here, meet me at the mall at four. 
right? There was no social media to send that out, and yet you had thousands of people come from all over the country because they believed in something. What's the mark you want to make? What are the tools you have to do it? And how do you use your powers for good? Thank you. There's a question up front. It's hard to see with the light in, sorry. Hi, um, my name is Patrick, and I'm a first year student at William Patterson University. And the, the presentation that you've talked about is like incredible, because I know people learned like, learning how to like, not to let go of the past, but to like, learn something valuable to it. I mean, because when I saw those pictures up there, I realized that people have gone through most of the traumatic times, like like the beans and everything. And you also mentioned helping a person out. Like, how do you help someone out who's in risk and avoiding like any other like risk like to the community and the entire world today? Thank you, Patrick. One of the things that I think is important about how we help other people and in turn how we help ourselves is understanding history. It means something to me when I hear debates about immigration in the United States right now. When I hear the words and the language, those people, we fear those people coming in. Because that's the very same language that was used when people were coming from Ireland. And this country was afraid that Irish immigrants were going to come, they were going to bring their Catholicism, they would be more loyal to the Pope than to the President, and we don't want those people here. That's the very same language we use today. So that Boston Public Schools, as an example, required the King James Bible in public schools. Why? Because they knew Catholic families did not want their children taught from the King James Bible. So it was a way of keeping Catholic children from public schools. So understanding history and saying, wait a minute, it's not that easy, that's a way that you as young people make that kind of change. You know the difference between right and wrong, right? Does not mean that your views and mine have to be the same. But when we start talking about people as things and as objects, that takes us away from where we've been as a country and also where we want to go. And let me also say, I hold no delusions that this is going to be as simple as all of you walking out, holding hands, singing Kumbaya, and then look, we solved this problem. We've been doing this literally since the founding of this country. What I also believe without a doubt is that the people who are best positioned to make that kind of change, young people. Every major movement in this country's history has been led by young people. Your activism and your energy, whether we are talking about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 60s, or we are talking about the Never Again movement out of Parkland, or Dream Defenders out of Florida, Black Youth Project in Chicago. Young people will inherit what happens here. Thank you, Patrick. Hi, uh, my name's Abby, I'm a third year. Do you think there will ever be a time where we don't see color, like skin color? It's a great question, Abby. So I, um, I do a, a weekly article for a publication called Diverse Issues in Higher Education Now. And one of um, the articles that I wrote earlier in the year was called The Myth of Meritocracy. And it was inspired by all of these really rich, affluent parents who were buying their kids' way into college, right? Like subverting the process and getting three weeks in jail. Um, I don't think we should ever have a time where we are colorblind. I don't think that's humanly possible. Let me tell you why. To be colorblind means that you don't see me. So I don't need us to be post-racial. I want us to be post-racism. The problem isn't that you look at me and see my racial identity or what you assume to be my racial identity. 
The problem is the values and judgments that we attach to what we see. That's what I want us to work on, right? All of us have biases. I know like the big, you know, teaching is on implicit bias. At the end of the day, bias is bias. It is a human cognitive response to see and make judgments. What we can intervene with is how we change those judgments and how we act on them. So whether that is that when my um, bio comes up and people look at the name and they make assumptions based on that, or whether that is me sitting in my home playing video games in a particular neighborhood and someone decides to shoot me within three seconds of yelling at me, those are the things that we should work on and encourage people to see as interventions that we need as a society. Thank you. We share. So Dr. Brown Dean, thank you for an incredible, um, enlightening, engaging, and judging by this, this, the comments and the questions from the students. Um, clearly you're taking something away from this. So thank you for thank you. joining our community thank so and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you.